All right, so that was uh, Professor Nico Pizzolatto talking about Gramsci and Fordism um, and its effects on um, sort of the broader capitalist economy, as well as how it blunts um, working class militancy. And one of the key things also, um, before we get into Max Weber, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, the general role of the state in capitalism, is that one of the things that Gramsci said should come out of this is that the working class needed to develop a very strong alternative culture, something that existed um, as an alternative to the emerging capitalist culture that was being created and was they were being integrated into as a result of um, this um, um, increasing Fordism uh, as, a, as a form of business practice. Okay, so Max Weber, he um, is of, of the liberal tradition, so he's not a Marxist. And what Max Weber is interested in, really, um, is the role of the state. Now, Max Weber is significant because he really is the father of sociology. So if we go to the next slide here, again, Max Weber is the father of modern sociology. He offers a sociological analysis of capitalism. He looks at things like the work ethic, capitalism and religion, law, bureaucracy, and the state. And his key contribution to an analysis of capitalism, even more so than uh, Gramsci, is that it's he's really the first person to have an extended examination of the role of the state in society. Remember, up until the mid to late 19th century, the state didn't really have a big role in society, um, particularly in a capitalist society, other than if we go back a few, you know, if we talk about um, colonialism, but in the domestic economy, the idea, as I said, was, at least in the late 19th century, that the state was kept at arm's length of the social relations of production. But by the mid 20th century, the state takes an active role in managing and regulating the social relations of production. And again, it's not just for the benefit of workers, it's also for the benefit of companies. We often think of state intervention in the economy as really for the benefit of workers. And that is true, but it also greatly benefits um, private capital as well. And it actually, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, has a role to play in the accumulation of capital um, in private industry. So again, what Max Weber is interested in is the role of the state, but he is also interested in culture in the same way that Gramsci is. The big difference is Max Weber is not a Marxist. And if you remember, if, um, if we remember when we go back to when I explained Marx's contribution to philosophy, right, his theory of history, that Marx was analyzing society from the bottom, right, the base social relations of production. Everything else to Marx was superstructural. So culture for Marx was superstructural. He would argue that culture emerges out of these base social relations of production, right? The substructure creates what we understand to be culture, music, um, working class culture, um, film, television, popular culture, the state, religion, all of these things are superstructural to what's going on down here, okay? Gramsci is of a similar tradition. Now, if we go back here, Weber is not a Marxist. So the difference between Gramsci and Weber philosophically is Gramsci is interested in how capitalism affects culture. Max Weber, as a liberal, it's reversed. It's how culture affects capitalism. Do you understand the difference, right? Gramsci and a Marxist looks at it from the material base of society. How does the material relations, the sub sort of the substructure of social relations of production create culture? Max Weber is the opposite. How does culture affect social relations of production? Now, what he's known for mostly, aside from his analysis of the state, is this idea of a Protestant work ethic. Um, in the late 19th, early 20th century, he produces a work called um, The Protestant Work Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. And this just gives you an example to how different philosophical traditions approach and understand and study something like the history of capitalism. So Max Weber argues that a lot of what caused the move, and again, nobody really believes this anymore, it's pretty much out of date, but the idea was that he argued that the emergence of capitalism in England and the United States and parts of Germany was the result of what he called the Protestant work ethic, that under the Protestant religion, there's a lot of emphasis placed on work, the celebration and, and in many ways, the, um, the, uh, this idea that work is something to be proud of and prized, right? That's where the Protestant work ethic comes from. And that ethic is what created the impetus for capitalism. Again, he's not a Marxist, so he's looking at how a culture of the Protestant work ethic gave rise to this, these much more productive economies. Um, of course, a Marxist looks at it the other way and says, no, the emergence of these economies gave rise to this concept of um, the Protestant work ethic. Now, you don't need to know a lot about that specifically, but it just gives you 
an understanding of how an, a Marxist and a non-Marxist, or rather a materialist and a non-materialist, look at and understand the role of culture in society. So again, the other key thing that Weber does is an extended analysis of the state. And this is the beginning of historians, um, theorists of capitalism, capitalism and economists really start to understand the role of the state in society, which is where we're going to turn to uh, next. So the state, as I kind of implied earlier, has two main functions under this um, new phase of late capitalism. It has legitimation functions and accumulation functions. So what I mean by legitimation functions is that it legitimates capitalism in the eyes of the people who benefit the least from capitalism. So again, if we think of that social hierarchy of capitalism, right, if you want to think about it in a very kind of simple way, we can go back to our bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Now, obviously, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, it's not that simple, right? The bourgeoisie is not always does not always act as one unit. There's different aspects of it. And same thing with the proletariat, right? There's skilled workers, unskilled workers, male workers, female workers. Gender has a role to play um, in the way that the working class is divided. Race and ethnicity also affect where a person sits on the social hierarchy of um, the socioeconomic hierarchy of capitalism. Right? So the people that we're talking about here are people who would be considered part of the proletariat, right? the people who are supposed to benefit the least under capitalism. What the intervention of the state in capitalism in the 1930s and the 1940s does um, is it basically it helps integrate them into the broader economy by legitimating capitalist relations of production. And it does that by offering what in many ways is social safety nets, right? So unemployment insurance is something that emerges out of the 1930s and the 1940s, right? That many of us were probably on um, in the beginning of the uh, spring semester when the coronavirus hit, right? That all of a sudden, it's, it's a cushion. It means if you lose your job, you will have some money. You're paying into an insurance system so that when you don't have a job, there's a cushion. You don't just have nothing, right? Workman's compensation or workers' compensation is another thing. Now, what this means is if you've ever injured yourself on the job, in Ontario, there's something called workers' compensation, which you can file a claim. And for if you can show that the injury that you had, especially if it's a chronic injury, is the result of your workplace environment, well, you're entitled to financial compensation because it happened on the job, right? Old age pensions is another one. So that you can work and not have to worry about what you're going to do in old age, that when you have to, that you will eventually be able to retire and there will be money for you. Now, obviously for my and your generation, this is a very different story, but the beginning of this is in the 1930s in the United States, in Canada, in England, in France, and again, the sort of broader capitalist economy. And what this does is it legitimates capitalism in the eyes of the kind of what we could call the industrial proletariat, because now they have options, right? There's a, there's a safety net for them. If they lose their job, right, they, they're not losing everything. The other thing, particularly in the United States, that the government helps do is, is um, facilitates mass homeownership for, say, working class people, especially after the Second World War. And what this does is it more intensely integrates the working class in the United States, or at least initially the white working class, into the consumptive aspect of the economy. Because now, if you own a home, it means you have a little bit of capital, right? Something that you could sell and live off when you retire, when you're older, right? So this is a lot of what it does. It legitimates capitalism by integrating the working class more into it, but also providing these social safety nets so that workers aren't just hired and disposed of, that if they're injured on the job, they don't have to worry that they can't work anymore. And that's the big thing with workers' compensation. When we look at those factories and industrial operations of the 19th century, if you injured yourself, well, basically, that was it, right? You were fired because you couldn't do your job anymore. And it was very difficult to get another job because let's say you lost a leg or an arm in a mine or in a blast furnace. Now you can't work, so how do you support yourself? Well, with workman's compensation, if that injury occurs on the job, you're entitled to financial compensation, possibly for the rest of your life. So there's these safety nets now exist that allow workers to buy into the system and also makes them far less vulnerable, which is why Gramsci argued that what this phase of capitalism does is it blunts working class militancy. Now, the other key aspect of um, the state's role in capitalism is in accumulation functions. Now, what this means is the state's role in 
private industry and business's ability to to accumulate capital. And the state takes an active role in actually helping and facilitating the accumulation of capital. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean in each um, aspect of it. So one key thing is the regulation of business. Now, in the 21st century, we often hear, particularly from um, business people in the interests of capital, that they don't want business regulated. In many ways, that's true. But often, what they imagine to be a free market is not the reality of what a free market is. It's a kind of utopian ideology of what they believe it to be. But as we saw in the 19th century, right, the free market that existed, right, and often when you hear a sort of market fundamentalist talk about, you know, this kind of utopian idea of a much freer market with little state intervention. They think the late 19th century, but as we saw last class, those markets were far from free. Even though it wasn't the state intervening in the market in the late 19th century, the reorganization of business for vertical and horizontal integrations, as well as trust, meant that business consolidated and converged and created monopolies and oligopolies, which meant the market was hardly free. Competition didn't exist to the same extent because the entire market, say in the case of Standard Oil, 90% was controlled largely by one man and one corporation. That's not really a free market. He controls price, he controls distribution, he controls everything. How do you compete with that? You really can't. So there's really no incentive to be innovative because you're gonna get crushed by the giant colossus. Imagine today, starting a company to try to compete with Amazon, like good luck, right? It's just, so how free is the market, right? So what the state does is it intervenes in the market to regulate business. And one of the things it does is to regulate competition, right? It's why even now you'll hear when, say for example, two major companies will try to merge, often the governments of various states have to sign off on it. Um, the biggest ones are the European Union and the United States. So for example, um, if a major U.S. telecom company wants to merge with another one, the U.S. government sometimes will have to sign off on it. I think the most recent example, <laughs> which I could get wrong here, was uh, the Walt Disney Corporation just bought the film division of Fox. So now all of a sudden you've got a really big film company, in the case of Walt Disney, buying another really big film company. The U.S. government had to sign off on that, that it wasn't going to create a monopoly. Now, we'll explain why in the last 30, 40 years governments have been less likely to stop mergers and acquisitions. They were much more activist in the mid 20th century. And we'll I'll talk about that next class when we get to neoliberalism. But this is what the regulation of business does. It allows for a more open competition within business so that there's a more of a level playing field so that innovation is what's driving competition and price, not the ability to just control a bunch of companies. Now, the other thing, that the state does in its accumulation functions is things like tariffs and trade agreements. The state will then seek out and go and negotiate trade agreements with other countries to allow their, um, their industries um, access um, to that uh, to that country, right? To have trade agreements between them. They also can function to protect their own industry. Now, this isn't something that's necessarily new, but the idea of tariffs, right, is a government intervention in the economy, right? If the government decides, as we saw even 200 years ago, right, when the shoemakers of Lynn, Massachusetts convince and the textile makers convinced the U.S. government to levy tariffs on British produced textiles because they wanted their domestic industry to grow. So here's another example where the state is actually intervening in the accumulation of capital, right? It's intervening to ensure that its domestic industries can accumulate capital, um, and not be subject to, say, foreign competition, as we saw 200 years ago. But this especially takes off in the 1930s and the 1940s. Now, the other really interesting one to look at is also subsidies. Now, the state in most capitalist economies will offer massive subsidies to certain industries. Like for in Canada, the oil industry in Alberta has, I think since the 1970s, the calculation was between 250 and $300 billion dollars of government subsidies. And subsidies can exist in the form of tax breaks, so a corporation gets a break on how much taxes they have to pay, or direct transfer of money from the state to private industry to develop an industry or to keep an industry afloat. So one of the really interesting examples of this, um, if we think of, is um, Silicon Valley is a really good example. And this speaks to, again, what I'm talking about, how a lot of people who argue for keeping the state at an arm's length in the economy often forget 
the role that the state has played in their specific industry. Silicon Valley is a perfect example. If we look at Silicon Valley, the entire industry was built on either direct government research or subsidies. So there's a reason why the Silicon Valley exists in San Francisco, because that's where um, Lawrence Livermore National Labs is, the amount of subsidies that were going from the U.S. federal government to the University of California, Berkeley, as well as Stanford University. It's also where a lot of the arms industry was that built ships um, to fight the Pacific War against the Japanese. So the entire industry that emerges in California, particularly in semiconductors, that is the beginning and the, the sort of... Um, the beginning of the computer electronics industry is the result of direct state support. And this gets even more intense in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. The internet itself was not invented by private business. The internet was invented by the US Defense Department so that satellites could talk to one another. That's what the internet was. I think it was originally called the ARPANET. Right? That's what the internet was. And then once the Cold War ended, that form of communication between computers and satellites was then put into the private sector. So the whole concept of Silicon Valley, right? These, and the reason I bring up Silicon Valley is it's kind of the vanguard of libertarian capitalist thought in the United States. It's the industry that says that they operate on this kind of market fundamentalism where you can rise and fall with the greatest innovation and they want government to stay out of it. When in reality, the entire industry only exists because of our government financing and subsidies or the creation of the very infrastructure that they use to operate their businesses on, right? The internet. Another example, if we want to go back in time in the 1950s, is the federal highway system in the United States. So in the 1950s, the US federal government built what's called the interstate highway system. So if any of you have ever taken road trips to the United States, you drive on um, what's referred to as the interstate system, which connected every city in the United States to a major highway that ran at about 60, 70 miles an hour or 100 kilometers an hour, right? And that allowed for a much greater expansion of business. Trucks could now ship across the United States. You didn't need to rely specifically on trains. This massively expanded the trucking industry and it allowed businesses all over the United States access to a national market even if you didn't have access to specific railroads. Right? The kind of famous example of this in the last couple of years is when Obama was debating Romney in, um, in 2012 and he said, you didn't build that to your business. And he wasn't saying you didn't build the business, but if you have a business, you're shipping it on roads that were built by the U.S. federal government. Right? So the role of the state in, in these accumulation functions is essential. Another example I had heard of was in the case of Ontario. The creation of the highway system is what allowed people in southern Ontario, at least middle class people, to buy and own cottages up north because now they had direct access to that area, created an entire way of living. Right? Um, Elon Musk is another example where he's always feuding with various governments and trying to play them off one another. And yet every business that he's built for the last 20 years has been financed by US government subsidies, Tesla, as well as SpaceX, right? So a lot of these leaders talk about a free market when in reality, most of who their investors is, is the state. So the state has a role to play in the development of capitalism. And this role emerges in the mid 20th century, what we're talking about. The other key thing that the state does um, and can do, and you see this especially in the United States, but really all over, um, capitalist economies is they seek out foreign markets um, for their countries, right? So you'll often see, and again, this kind of relates to trade agreements and things like that, but it's seeking out another market so that their companies can then sell to new people, right? In some ways, it could be a form of neo-imperialism, but often what it is, is states and governments sending people to another part of the world, to another country to negotiate trade agreements, which then opens up a new market for private industry. And the only real actor that can do that is the state, right? Because the state is still the sovereign power in the world. Despite what people say about the state kind of withering away in the early 21st century, the state is still essential, um, even under neoliberal capitalism, which we'll talk about uh, next class. So this just gives you an example of the role that the state is now playing. Now, by the 1950s, this kind of reaches its zenith, where you get the integration of the working class into the consumptive aspect of the economy, right? The legitimation of capitalism to the working class, and also the state providing a direct role in the accumulation of capital for private industry. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. And then what we're going to do is look at a case study of U.S. steel, um, what happens after 
um, the 1950s and the 1960s. Then we'll look at the emergence of the Global Assembly Line. 